afternoon to all. Welcome to the BSI webinar on Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. We are delighted to have you all here today with us. I am Aprajita Singh, a marketing executive representing BSI India. Before we start this webinar, I would like to uh, lay some ground rules for our audience. You have joined the webinar in the listen mode only, and you are welcome to ask as many uh, questions throughout this webinar using our uh, question box. We will answer the question in the Q&A round at the end, and any we don't will be answered after this webinar. We will be sharing the recording with you all, and I would encourage all of you to participate in our upcoming polls to have your say and be are with us. If there are any uh, technical difficulties, we will fix those as soon as we can. In today's digital world, personal data protection has become more crucial than ever before. The Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023 is a significant milestone in addressing the concerns and ensuring the privacy and security for our personal data in the IT sector. To guide us through this act, we have two distinguished speakers with us today. Let me introduce to our first speaker, Mr. Ravindra Narayanappa, who is the journal manager of IT, IETES, BSI India. He has worked in information security sector for 22 years, taking care of network infrastructure and software applications ranging from design, development, and maintenance. He has been working with BSI for nine years as the head of the IT sector certification for India. Our second speaker is Mr. Dheeraj Saxena. He is our uh, subject matter expert for various best practices in IT sector. He is an auditor and the master trainer for multiple disciplines such as IT service management, information security, privacy, um, business continuity management, risk management, and corporate integrity uh, management. His total experience exceeds 30 years, out of which 18 years are invested in IT-enabled services industries for leading the IT operations, governance, risk, and compliance, and technical pre-sales management. So let's get started. Over to you, Ravendra. Good. So, thank you, Aprajita, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to this uh, session on uh, DPDPA Act. Uh, we have, uh, as per the agenda, the, uh, initially the introduction, speaker introduction is completed, and we have BSI introduction. Then uh, Dilaj is going to talk about the next uh, agenda item on uh, new data production bill highlights, uh, why organization needs uh, such a systematic approach uh, for data privacy solution and protection, and how the ISO standard 27701 will help you to meet the requirements of uh, Data Privacy Act and a roadmap uh, to the organizations to uh, implement and those who wants to get certified uh, you will have the details uh, provided and lastly uh, we take the question and uh, answers uh, please provide all your questions uh, in the uh, chat box and uh, where possible we'll uh, pick up those questions and answer and uh, some of them uh, we will uh, try to answer otherwise in the end uh, we have the time to answer these uh, questions about uh, uh, BSI. Uh, BSI is uh, around uh, more than 120 uh, year old uh, company. And uh, yeah, next slide, uh, Dheeraj. Yeah, uh, okay. And it is uh, incorporated by uh, Royal Charter uh, from, by the British government, where we reinvest the uh, uh, profits to invest on the progress and uh, to increase the trust between various uh, stakeholders. We help the organization to achieve their uh, goals and grow sustainably uh, while balancing the need for uh, profits as well as the needs for uh, planet and its uh, uh, people. So ultimately, we help the business and society to thrive together in this increasingly digital and uh, more sustainable world. Next slide. So uh, as a trusted catalyst uh, for change, we uh, bring together uh, leading uh, thinkers, uh, subject matter experts, innovators, and practitioners to create the uh, best practice uh, standards uh, and uh, the regulatory uh, frameworks. By implementing and uh, certifying against the standards, uh, regulations, and uh, consciousness best uh, practices, so we, we are uh, a catalyst for a positive change 
creating an enduring legacy of uh, improvement for our uh, clients, their customers, and uh, society at large. So uh, coming to the uh, sustainable uh, uh, growth, here are some uh, few points among uh, many other which we help the organization to achieve their sustainable growth. Uh, in this, uh, we have uh, uh, GHG emission, uh, water and uh, waste uh, management, ethical uh, supply chain, uh, sustainable uh, infrastructure, is some of the uh, uh, points which I have mentioned. On the digital trust, as we go grow uh, and increasingly adopting the digital across all areas of our uh, life. Uh, there is a trust factor which is uh, required and in this uh, regard you know uh, the organizations are obligated to provide this kind of a trust between the users and the service providers so organizations uh, needs to uh, do this by way of uh, digital governance and risk management data stewardship and uh, artificial intelligence ethics cyber security and privacy sustainable infrastructure So our uh, CEO has uh, clearly uh, reiterated uh, in the changing scenario of financial environment and uh, social uh, climate, which is uh, continuously uh, shifting. So BSI founding purpose to benefit the society is more relevant uh, uh, now than ever before. So among the service and the solutions, uh, what we have to our customers uh, to begin with, uh, we have a, a knowledge uh, solutions, uh, knowledge sharing uh, solutions, as well as uh, you know uh, developing the standards, the best practices uh, is is uh, one of the area, and the uh, other area happens to be the uh, assurance uh, services where we perform the system certification, product certification, and uh, training. And uh, next is on the regulatory services, uh, where especially the medical devices, which are highly regulated, we provide uh, services to meet those regulatory requirements. And lastly, there is a separate consulting services, uh, which help uh, in providing you the uh, kind of a gap assessment or verification assessment, advice, implementation, and continual improvement. So with the, with the, 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 we have a good uh, global uh, presence uh, worldwide uh, with almost, uh, we have 87 offices operating from 193 uh, countries with uh, 5,000 plus uh, colleagues and uh, 84K uh, clients. So with this, uh, you know, this, this uh, goes a long way in terms of how our partnership approach are helping uh, clients to adopt the best practices to meet their uh, business goals. Then uh, next slide, uh, Neeraj. Good. So with this, uh, I will now uh, hand it over to uh, Neeraj to provide information on uh, DPDPA, which has been recently uh, approved, and uh, we'll get some insights on this act to comply for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravindra. Uh, really appreciate that. So today I'm going to talk about two aspects, A, the Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023, what are the nuances, and we'll also look at what organizations need to do with a systematic approach in order to become compliant in the near future. But let's get started. Uh, whatever we are presenting is in summary form for the purpose of general guidance and Detailed notifications are awaited on this particular act by the central government. Let's look at the scope, applicability, and enforcement of this act. This act, as the name suggests, uh, is meant for protecting your personal data, yours and mine's personal data. So what is personal data? So when you registered for this BSI webinar, you gave your name, you gave your email address, phone number maybe, that is your personal data, which helps anyone else to identify with you. These are some obvious examples, but let, let's look at some uh, implicit examples. So for example, the IP address, which your laptop is using, 
if it's a static IP address, then I can associate your identity with that IP address. Or let's look at a real life situation such as uh, you are sharing your GPS location on your mobile. And if someone can associate that location with your identity, then that location is also your digital personal data. So it's not just the name and address and phone number, but any unique identifier which can be used to track you. So let's be wary of what we share. Let's talk about another very, very important term, which is processing. The word processing means that if someone is even looking at your data, forget about collecting it. If someone is even accessing your data, then that person or that entity is accessing it. So in the technical terms, wholly or partially automated operation, whether it is manual or operation, uh, automated or partially or automated, anything that you do with digital personal data is comprising processing. The applicability of this particular act is not only within the territory of India, definitely within the territory of India, because it's the law of the land now, uh, also outside the territory of India. So for example, if you are providing your personal data in a digital form, to a service provider, no matter where the servers of that service provider are, maybe they have taken it on a cloud, no matter where your personal data is, that service provider is obligated to protect your data and acknowledge uh, the rights of the data subject, which is you and I. Uh, in the applicability, <clears throat> it is not meant for data which is not for business use. That means if you are using it for domestic or personal use or you are voluntarily giving it on social media, then this act does not apply because you're doing it voluntarily and for the purpose of maybe domestic or personal use for your friends and family. This act has received presidential consent on the 11th of August this year and we are awaiting the enforcement date uh, for this act. There will be a data protection board, which is going to be set up very shortly, maybe this year, maybe next year. It's for the government to apprise us for enforcing this act. And more notifications will follow from the government on various aspects in terms of notifying data subjects or data principles in terms of what kind of consent, et cetera, to be taken that will follow. Let's look at the key stakeholders which are involved in this entire gamut of things. It's first and foremost, you and I. So we are called a data principle as per this act. You and I are called a data principle. So individuals to whom the personal data relates is the data principle. As I mentioned, personal data is not only your name, address, telephone number, but any other identifier such as your mobile phone location, which can be used to track you, to associate with your identity. If the personal data corresponds to a minor, which is person below 18 years of age, then the parents or lawful guardian of that minor are the data principles because they are accountable for deciding whether it should be shared or not. The second important stakeholder in this act is the data fiduciary. This term fiduciary might sound a bit complex. In simple terms, what it means is that person or entity which determines the purpose why the data is being collected. So if they are collecting your data or my data, personal data, they are the entity who is determining for what reason and what will they do with it? How will they process it? That's the data fiduciary and it, there are so many obligations for the data fiduciary to protect your personal data as we shall see in a couple of minutes. And then if the data fiduciary decides to outsource your data, then that entity which is processing your personal data on behalf of the data fiduciary is called the data processor. Let's take an example here. So you've taken a mobile connection from a telecom provider 
and they are the data fiduciary because they decide what details to be collected they want your identity proof they want your address proof and so on and so forth and then that data uh, uh, provider or the telecom provider wants to outsource the help desk to another call center that call center is the data processor which is processing your data on behalf of the telecom provider so that data processor is equally accountable to safeguard your data and that accountability will be as part of the agreement between the data fiduciary and the data processor the sla or the service level agreement so these are the key stakeholders the ethos of this particular act is based on consent so if you remember the the whole concept of consent was uh, in the good old days, suppose for the sake of discussion, you were uh, going for a medical procedure or a surgery, and they used to take your consent before carrying out that procedure. And the reason was they wanted your agreement. And in that consent, they used to specify very, very clearly what purpose uh, they're going to operate on you, what will be the consequences possibly, and uh, and, and, and then unless you agree, they can't do anything. Now, apply that same logic to the consent which uh, the data fiduciary has to take from you. You are the data principal, the data fiduciary. Say, for example, again, your telecom uh, operator uh, with whom you have subscribed your tele, uh, mobile connection, they need to obtain a very specific consent from you the data principal before processing your data if you've already given your personal data then as soon as the act is enforced they need to provide you with another specific notice or notify you that look this is the data which we have collected from you your personal data this is the purpose for which we are utilizing your data and uh, these are the ways and means uh, through which you can exercise your rights as a data principal. So you have some rights and I'll take you through those rights also. They need to enumerate those rights. And if you're not satisfied whether they're doing the job correctly or not, then you have a right to make a complaint to the data protection board as well. All this has to be mentioned in the notification by the data fiduciary. So consent is the key cornerstone here. The other aspect of consent is that it should be free. They can't charge you for that, right? It has to be very specific. That means they have to specify for what purpose they need your personal data, and they can't infringe that purpose. So for example, if your telecom service provider is taking your personal data for the purpose of subscription to their network, they can't possibly use it for uh, sales and marketing. They can't share it with any other entity because the purpose is very, very specific and then it shall be unconditional they can't put conditions on that consent and it has to be in very very clear language unambiguous there should not be any legal jargon in fact as per the act uh, the data fiduciary needs to give you the option of reading and understanding that uh, consent in any of the languages specified in our constitution so that's a humongous task for data fiduciaries that suppose your local language is marathi for the sake of discussion then you need to be you need to have the consent in that language so that you can understand it it should be very very simple unambiguous no legal jargon here and it should specify the purpose so and the third aspect is that if you the data principal want to withdraw the consent at any point of time you have the option to do that and with comparable ease. So the ease with which you gave your personal data in the first instance, same um, amount of ease with which you can withdraw it. Obviously then the data fiduciary will obviously cease to provide you the services, but you have the right to withdraw it. And then the data fiduciary is obligated to stop the processing of your personal data by taking it out of their production systems within reasonable time so let's look at some illustrations in each of these illustrations <coughs> wherever you see the letter x that means you and i and wherever you see the letter y that's the data fiduciary or the data controller 
Now let's look at the first example. So X, which is you and I, gave your consent for the processing of your personal data to an online shopping app or website. So this is for enthusiasts of online shopping like you and I, and we have given our com uh, consent for processing our data. Obviously, we would have given our address, phone number, etc. Now, when the act commences, this data fiduciary Y uh, give a notification to all of us via email or in in the in-app notification or any other uh, effective method for describing what personal data they have and for the purpose that which they are using your uh, personal data. So they have to do that. Let's look at another illustration. And this talks about purpose limitation and data minimization. Remember I mentioned that the purpose has to be very specific. They can't use it for any other purpose. If they do, then they are transgressing or contravening the act. The other thing is data minimization. That means they can't just ask you that, okay, give me your Aadhaar card number also, give me your PAN card and so on and so forth. They have to minimize it. If one document itself is adequate for proving your identity and address, then what's the need for more documents? So let's look at this example. X, which is you and I, downloads a telemedicine application on our mobile phone. Now, obviously, before you uh, can start working with this application, as part of the installation, it asks your consent. And it asks uh, your consent for the specific purpose of processing your personal data for telemedicine services. By the way, if that application also wants to access your mobile phone contact list, now, why do they need that data? They need just your contact number. Why do they need the, uh, the, the details of all your relatives and near and dear ones? So, since the phone contact list is not necessary for making available the telemedicine services, this consent shall be limited automatically to that personal data, which is your personal data for telemedicine services. They can't access your phone list. They can't access your location. Why is that needed? That's called the principle of data minimization, which all these data fiduciaries need to adhere. If they give you uh, or if they take your consent in such a way that that consent limits your rights then that's a conditional consent and that conditional consent is not applicable it's not valid so consent should be unconditional so let's look at this example x which is you and i buy an insurance policy either from the mobile app or a website of y an insurer and you give your consent for processing your personal data, maybe which includes your family member details also for the purpose of issuing the policy. In that consent, suppose for the sake of discussion, they want you to waive off or forego your right to file a complaint to the Data Protection Board, then that condition is not applicable. And that waiver of right to file a complaint shall be invalid automatically. So they can't contest it. So I think good provisions for protecting uh, the data, personal data of the uh, data principal. And then, as I mentioned, you can withdraw your consent anytime. So if you've already given your consent to an e-commerce service provider, now you want to withdraw it, then they, they need to acknowledge that request of yours within reasonable time and stop processing your data, of course, after processing or uh, delivering your existing orders which you have already uh, processed. So these are the, I think, uh, features uh, in the interest of the data principle. Let's look at more specific examples of the data fiduciary or the entity which is collecting and processing your data. So irrespective of any agreement or uh, you know, any other condition, they are accountable, wholly accountable for complying with the provisions of this act. They need to implement appropriate technical and organization controls or measures. So let's look at some examples here. Technical controls can be role-based access control within the organization itself. So for example, uh, if uh, an organization like a telecom service provider is collecting your data, why should their sales and marketing team or HR team have access to it? They cannot. So role-based access control is one example of a technical control. Another example could be uh, encrypting your data. 
while transferring your data from one location to another, they need to encrypt it. And these are just examples. Let's look at some organizational measures. So organizational measures could be a policy related to privacy, having objectives related to privacy, roles and responsibilities defined within the organization with respect to privacy, some kind of a data inventory being taken, then a governance mechanism. These are all examples of organizational measures. So who needs to do this, the data fiduciary? They need to acknowledge and implement the rights of data principles, which is you and I. So if I give them a request for erasing my data, not only do they need to acknowledge it and respond to my request in affirmative, but they also need to implement that. So how do they implement it? They take it out of their production systems and they stop using it, they maybe uh, archive it. So it's no longer in use and they can't share it with any other entity. So <clears throat> another very, very important aspect which I discovered in this act is that if, if the processing of data is likely to cause a detrimental effect to a child or a minor, that's absolutely prohibited. They can't even process it. They can't even collect it. They can't even view it. They're prohibited from tracking and behaviorally monitoring the children and you can, they can't do any targeted advertising at them also, irrespective of consent being taken. It's not just possible, which is a good thing actually. Despite all these technical organization controls being in place, there are threats. And if those threats materialize, that means if there's a data breach, somehow, uh, the personal data of you and I is leaked uh, or something happens either by the fiduciary or the contractor, which is the data processor, then they need to notify not only the data protection officer, uh, uh, sorry, they need to notify not only the data protection board, but also all the data principles like you and I, uh, that this has happened. This is what we are doing to contain the impact of this breach. And these are the measures which have already put in place. So they need to notify proactively within a specified period of time. I think we'll have notifications on all these aspects as to how many hours be before this uh, notification has to go to the data protection board and the data principles. So let's look at a question here. We've gone through so many obligations of the data fiduciary. We've talked about what are the roles and responsibilities of uh, data fiduciaries? What are your rights? My question is, does your organization currently have all the policies, procedures, and governance structure to comply with this act? Remember, each one of our organizations is either a data fiduciary or a data processor, or both. But it applies to all of us. So let's look at that and we value your opinion. So please do click on one of these radio buttons, yes, no, or maybe if you need more information. So Chavinder, if we can have the results of the poll. Yeah. So yes, 45%, no 13, and maybe that means uh, sitting on the fence is around 43%. So around 56% need more information or more help. Uh, to do this. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chavinda. So let me just share my screen once again. Let's look at our rights and duties and data principles, the other side of the coin. So what are our rights? We, we talked about right to access information about personal data. If I, as a data uh, principal, send an email to, say, my uh, telecom provider, uh, asking them what personal data you're holding, 
and I want to understand for what purpose. So they need to acknowledge it and respond to you within a specified time. And they need to give you very, very objective details on what personal data they have, how are they using it, and what rights do you have? And then if, you, if you're not satisfied with that, you can escalate it to the data protection board. If you want to correct your data, suppose you've moved to another residence or your mobile number has changed and you want to update your details, you have the right to get it updated uh, or corrected. And you'll need to give some appropriate uh, evidences about the uh, changed data as well. If you're not satisfied with the way uh, the your request has been dealt with by the data fiduciary, you have the right to redressal of your grievance, either from the data fiduciary directly or the consent manager, and you can complain to the data protection board also. If for whatever reason the data uh, principal is incapacitated to exercise his or her rights, then that person can nominate another person to exercise their rights. This provision is also there. Let's look at the duties of you and I as data principals. So not to impersonate any other person while giving your personal data, not to suppress material information, which is sought by the data fiduciary, not to register a false complaint. And if you are wanting to have your data corrected, then you furnish only authentic and verifiable information uh, before you want to correct your data and all comply with all the other applicable laws as well. Let's talk about the Data Protection Board, uh, which is another key stakeholder here. Now, Data Protection Board, uh, the chairperson and other members shall be directly appointed by the central government. They shall hold office for a period of two years. They have the authority to investigate any potential breach or any reported breach or wherever the violation of rights of data principle is happening or maybe if the government is advising them to investigate a particular uh, data fiduciary or data processor then they have the authority to do that as well and 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 the penalties in the event of a breach are a bit humongous so for example if a data fiduciary fails to take reasonable safeguards if they're not bothered about any safeguards or protecting the personal data then the fine can be up to 250 crore rupees, up to, depending on the severity of the breach. If they fail to observe additional obligations for children, remember we discussed that for children, they can't just do any targeting advertising, they can't process the data, they can't monitor the behavior, no matter what the consent is. And if yet, if they are doing it, then a fine of up to rupees 200 crores can be levied by the Data Protection Board or for any other breach apart from this, say 50 crores rupees for any other provision breached under this act. If a data principle like you and I is uh, not adhering to our duties, which I mentioned on the previous slide, then they can be fined up to rupees 10,000. This is as per the act. So let's look at the second poll question. Is your organization in need of a systematic and demonstrable approach to comply with this act? There are, of course, a lot of risks. The risk of non-compliance, the risk of penalty, the risk of brand being impacted. How are you going to manage these risks? Do you need a systematic and demonstrable approach? Let us know. We value your input. So let everyone exercise their input. Let's give it maybe 30 more seconds for people to respond. All right, can we have the responses now? 
so yes 56 percent are saying yes we need a systematic and demonstrable approach to comply with this act and manage the risk or control the risks of penalty uh, a very small percentage say no they don't need a systematic approach we'd be happy to talk to you also and uh, another 31 percent say maybe uh, maybe we want to do a gap assessment and analyze what controls we have are they robust or not so 31 percent are saying maybe let's look at that we are open to that all right thank you so much Chavinda. The reason why organizations need to have a systems approach, a systematic approach for data privacy, because it's not only a matter of the risk and compliance function to execute this and become compliant. It, imagine your sales and marketing department for the sake of discussion is gathering personal data of prospective customers. They already have data of existing customers and they're sending it left, right and center and it becomes uncontrollable for you to detect where it has gone. You need a very, very systematic approach across the board for all the departments. Let's look at this. Not only the systematic approach, but also that approach which is aligned with the data protection laws, whether it is the Digital Personal Data Protection Act or the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, or any other law, whether it is HIPAA or California Privacy Act, so you need to be in sync with the data protection laws. And this particular systematic approach should be a vehicle for demonstrating compliance to these data protection laws. It should be people and process based across various departments. So it's not only the risk and compliance team or internal audit team, which is implementing this systematic approach, but every department, whoever is collecting personal data, remember, every organization has data of other organizations the customers for example sales and marketing is collecting that as we speak hr has employee data so at any given point of time your organization is a data fiduciary also and or a data processor you are processing it on behalf of your client both ways this act applies and both ways uh, you need to do something about it so how about an approach which can give measurable and demonstrable benefits. So for example, I, as a top management of my organization, suppose want to look at how many uh, responses from the data principles, which is our customers have gone on time. How many complaints are there related to personal data? Is there a reduction in complaints? Is there a uh, enhancement of customer satisfaction with respect to their personal data? Uh, how many requests have come to us uh, related to erasure and how have, how have we complied on time? Or maybe what are the top risks and have they been uh, mitigated or treated on time? Or maybe how many people have been trained in our organization? What's the percentage of persons who know what is data protection, what is their role and responsibility and what are the consequences of not adhering to our privacy policies? All these answers can be given to you with a systems-based approach so that you know how good is good and where we are in terms of compliance. And then instead of reinventing the wheel, having another management system, having another, another team which is implementing that and auditing that, why don't we readily integrate this, uh, these controls related to data protection with our existing information security management system or ISMS? Uh, most of the organizations in India and abroad have implemented ISO 27001, which is a globally acknowledged standard for information security. So that's the answer. And the answer is ISO 27701 meets all these criteria, which I mentioned in the last slide. It is built on top of ISO 27001. So ISO 27001, which your organization may have already implemented, or even if you want to implement, you can do that and, and then extend those controls to data protection as well by meeting the requirements of ISO 27701. So 27701 builds on top of 27001. It's an extension to 27001. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just have to take an incremental approach here. There is 
a lot of additional guidance for data fiduciaries and data processors in ISO 27701, which will help all these organizations like yours and mine to fulfill our responsibilities and become compliant with this act and other acts such as the GDPR also. And all these controls are basically policies and procedures for data fiduciaries and processors and best practices which we can follow. ISO 27701 has got a direct mapping with EU GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulation, and our act, which we are discussing today, the Digital Personal Data Protection Act, is a subset of GDPR. So if it can meet GDPR obligations, it can definitely meet uh, DPDP 2023 obligations if the organization is readily able to customize its pol existing policies and procedures. So incremental approach instead of reinventing the wheel due to ISO 27701. Let's look at the possible roadmap for going forward and becoming compliant to Digital Personal Data Protection Act. So let's look at three phases, three milestones. The first one being understanding in which the organization determines its role, whether it is a data processor, data fiduciary, uh, what are the application laws and regulations? What are the expectations of the stakeholders, such as your clients, such as your uh, regulators? So determining the context is the very first step. Once you've done that, then where are we today in terms of complying with this act or complying with ISO 27701? So you need to understand the requirements of the standard and that's where BSI can help you. And then you will be able to see what are the gaps and how to close those gaps. And then accordingly, you can formulate your training content for your implementation team, for your internal audit team, and for your end users. So it should be customized. The training should be customized for each role within your organization if you want to maximize the opportunity. Then you will also parallelly formulate privacy policies, privacy objectives, and it has to be a cross-functional approach. Remember we were talking about it has to be across the board. It can't be just with the risk and compliance department only. Everyone, every department has ownership to comply with the controls and report on the effectiveness of these controls. Once you've formulated the policies and procedures, then it's time to communicate the privacy policies and updated objectives. And remember we were saying that instead of reinventing the wheel, why don't you take an incremental approach? So why don't you modify your existing information security policy, which you already have, and make it relevant for data protection as well. So that's an incremental approach. You already have a set of information security objectives. Maybe you can add some more on top of that. And those are privacy related objectives. Then let's look at the second milestone, which is having understood the context and what's to be done and maybe coming out with policies, procedures, that's the intent. Now let's look at the implementation or the on-ground implementation. So implement technical controls, and these are just some examples, role-based access, data minimization with the help of software tools, encryption, encryption is already there with most of the organizations, but are we encrypting personal data is the question. And maybe if and when you are erasing the personal data or making it uh, unusable for production, then maybe you can anonymize it. That's another technique. So you can have software and tools and techniques for that as well. Then what about having an ongoing uh, system or process of having the data inventory. So which department is collecting what personal data or has what data for that personal data with each department, have they got the consent? Do they actually need it? How are they minimizing it? And how are they implementing access control within that department particularly? That's, uh, these are some of the objectives of the data inventory. And you can do risk assessment also in each of the department and assign process owners to be accountable for controlling those risks within their own department. So it's a cross-functional approach, not just one department. More procedural controls. So for example, building standard operating systems 
uh, standard operating procedures while collecting the data, having a maker checker concept for personal data. If someone is collecting the personal data, is there another independent person who is actually checking whether whatever data was needed has been collected or more than that has been collected or there is some other transgression. So, and these are just some examples. There can be numerous procedural controls. Then legal controls. How are you going to uh, formulate the, the notification to be sent to your subscribers or the data principals? If they, uh, suppose, are contacting you and they want to exercise their rights, how are you going to respond to them in a manner which is legally compliant? And, and, we, uh, and how are you responding to the data subject access request? You have the term here DSAR, the full form is data subject access request. And this has been taken uh, from GDPR. So you are the data principal or the data subject. If they give an access request, I want to know what data is being processed for what purpose. How are you going to respond to that data subject access request on time? And has it been done appropriately or not? So you may need your legal advisory team also to formulate those responses for you. And then talking about other measures of effectiveness, how do how does a top management ascertain whether the whole privacy management system or data protection management system is effective or not? And these are just examples of some measures. How many data subject access requests have been responded on time? Is there a reduction in customer complaints? Is there a reduction in actual or potential incidents of data protection? Or uh, how many technical vulnerabilities exist in an application and how many have been resolved so far? And these are just uh, some examples, other examples could be, uh, have the internal and external audit findings been closed on time? How many trainings uh, have been done and how many people are trained? Have they, have they been assessed or evaluated for the training effectiveness? So many measures. And then once you've implemented that, then you conduct your internal audits, supplier audits, because most of you would have outsourced some data processing to your data processors. So those are your suppliers and business partners. Conduct your due diligence before onboarding them. Even after onboarding them, you want to carry on with the due diligence and conduct audits also. And then whatever gaps are discovered in these audits need to be closed. Senior management review, all these inputs going to the senior management because senior management intervention uh, can help the organization uh, build a privacy culture. Without the senior management uh, intervention, the risk to the organization will increase. And you've seen the penalties which can be imposed. So without senior management uh, intervention, the culture of data protection may not be successful in the organization. They need to walk the talk. They need to review it often in their existing review meetings uh, because we want to follow an incremental approach rather than building a a new system altogether. So whatever existing reviews are happening by the top management, they can include some questions related to data protection as well. So culture for protecting personal data, I think is directly uh, attributable to the top management. And then process improvement trainings and so on and so forth, depending on what gaps have been detected and whether those process improvement trainings and remedial actions have been effective or not. So with all that which needs to be done, another question logically is, do you think that the systematic approach provided by ISO 27701, which builds on top of ISO 27001, may be beneficial for your organization? Let's So we value your input. Please do let us know. Okay, maybe we can have the responses now. 
all right so 86% and that's a whopping percentage are thinking that yes we need a systematic approach and maybe ISO 27701 can help them have that approach thank you so much uh, Chavinder and let's move on so if you need more information on trainings gap assessments you're welcome to contact us and we're going to share this presentation with you there's a qr code as well and do let us know if you want to be contacted by a bsi representative we'll be happy to do that so over to you chavinder for that and let's quickly close that poll within 30 seconds in the interest of time So maybe we can have the results now. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So I'm, I'm done with my bit and I thank you for your time. So we can have the Q&A now. Yes. Uh, uh, thank so you, we, uh, Mr. Dheeraj, yeah. uh, for this insightful session. And uh, I, we have a lot of questions. Uh, let me uh, ask you a few adhering the time. Uh, so one yeah. person asks, DPDP is only valid for citizens of India or the residents mm -hmm. of India and any personal data processing within the Indian territory. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. So it is applicable to all organizations, whether international, domestic, who are operating within the territory of India, point number one. Point number two, if any organization even outside the territory of india and i'm talking about data fiduciaries who are collecting our data if they are collecting data of citizens who are within india residing within india then it applies to them as well or if they are processing and transporting your data to some other country outside india even then they need to adhere to all these safeguards which you mentioned hope that answers your question Aparajita, over to you okay so the second question is, okay, one person asked, oh, will it be possible to get the slides? Yes, definitely. After the session, uh, we will share you the presentation uh, as well as the survey form. We would uh, encourage you to kindly fill up that survey form and uh, get the slides. Um, the question is, uh, um, data fiduciary is uh, pro if processing data on behalf of enterprise is the consent needed from individual from each individual, or is it okay to have consent from, uh, you know, at the enterprise tech stakeholder level or agreement? So it the consent is needed by from each data principal, each individual, to answer mm -hmm. your question. Okay. Because only that individual uh, can decide what personal data to be shared and for what purpose. Sure. Okay, the next question is, uh, does free consent mean it is not chargeable or does it mean it should not be given without any hesitation? Yeah, sorry. So can you repeat that question, please? Thank you. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, one person asked, does free consent mean it is not chargeable or does it mean it should be given without any hesitation? It should be given without any hesitation. And they can't charge express uh, also for that. But to your point, to answer the question very specifically, without any hesitation, given freely, without any duress, is the answer. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, one person asked if uh, if the government also can uh, covered as fiduciary. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah. So compliance to the act applies to all government departments as well. Uh, there are certain uh, 
you can say exceptions that if the government is processing the data for the purpose of investigation or in the sovereignty of our country then they may not acknowledge the rights of the data subject but yet they have to protect the data hope that answers okay. your question sure sir so uh, next person ask uh, can an uh, ex employee of a company write to the company to remove the personal data and is company obligated to do so so the short answer is yes and they will retain at least that much data which is mandated by law to be retained even after the person leaves so for example okay. if the law says that you have to retain the data for 7 years within 7 years the person has left so then the law prevails but then they have to remove it from their production systems and they can't use it for any other purpose they just archived it because the law says so that you know it says like that and if if for whatever whatever government agency needs their personal data for the processing of provident fund or any other aspect then it it should be given only then sure okay thank you for that uh the next question is uh we are already complying to iso 27001 and pci uh, dss standards what more measures are needed to ensure that uh they are complying with dpdp thank you for that question so i think the first step could be to become aware of the requirements of iso 27701 and the simple reason for that is that iso 27001 is a generic standard for information security which includes personal data as well but may not have specific controls in annexure a for protecting personal data in terms of technical and procedural controls 27701 which is an extension to 27001 is more focused on data protection and it can be readily used to build on top of existing 27001 implementation which you have already got in your organization so my my humble request is have a look at 27701 what its provisions are and then you will you will become absolutely clear on what else needs to be done okay i hope that answer your question and uh, thank you and the next question would be sir um is data in encryption at common level in database needed or basic disk level in mm. encryption and mm. key based data back uh, all right that's a very good question so my sense is if if encryption at the entire database level can suffice the purpose then you don't need to go for more encryption there's a principle of risk management which says and this is very generic risk management principle which i'm telling you the higher the level of risk a given risk the more the rigor of treating that risk so if the risk is high then maybe you'll put more compensating controls on top of this data encryption so you'll have role based access also you'll give training and awareness also you will do monitoring and review also you'll do internal audit also these are additional controls on top of that encryption which you mentioned higher the risk more the rigor of controls is the answer to your question but to your point technologically you may not need another level of encryption on the database if you already have one thank you uh so the next question is um this act is very similar to eu uh, gdpr are there any thing additional or different from the dpdp act so the, the the responsibilities of the data principle which we saw here and the penalties which can be incurred by the data principle which is uni also up to inr 10000 something new and uh, there are many differences i would say eu gdpr is quite overarching okay quite overarching uh, so and and this has its own nuances we are awaiting uh, more notifications by the central government on this act in terms of not only the enforcement but various other aspects which are the nitty gritty of implementation let's look at that also but as on date if you read the act you will see that it is very very similar to gdpr as you rightly mentioned in your question also okay okay uh so we'll take few more um 
the next question is is data fiduciary and data controllers are both same or not yes they are same exactly the same in eu gdpr it is called data controller here it is called data fiduciary synonyms sure uh, we have so many questions left. Uh, I would take one more. Um, so uh, it says, uh, is ISO 27701 aligned with the new DPTP Act? And this person has uh, four more questions related to the same question. So uh, I'll ask uh, after this, sir. Uh, you can answer the first okay. one first. All right. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is yes. And the reason for that is because in ISO 27701, there is a one-to-one -one mapping with EU GDPR. As we just mentioned in the last question, there are a lot of similarities between DPDP 2023, India Act, and GDPR. Hence, ISO 27701 can be used to a large extent for demonstrating compliance to DPDP 2023 as well by molding your policies and procedures accordingly and looking at the context also. So, for example, if the DPDP mandates that uh, if there's a data subject access request and you need to respond within say 24 hours, then you'll have to modify your procedure accordingly. GDPR may say you have to respond within 72 hours or respond within one month, but this has a different timeline. So you'll have to tweak your procedure accordingly. The turnaround times will be different, right? For both the acts. I'm giving just one example in terms of difference, but largely I'm saying to me there are a lot of commonalities between this one and the EU GDPR. And, okay. and, and maybe to answer this question objectively, if you can have a look at 27701, it'll help you. But the short answer is yes, to a very, very great extent. Okay. So the second part of this same question is, what if the personal data is collected on a piece of paper, such as the paper-based mm. bank account opening form, and it never gets digitized? If it never gets digitized, then this act is not applicable. But let me assure you, it will get digitized. But theoretically, to your question, if it never gets digitized, and never is the keyword, then this act is not applicable because it's applicable for digitized data. Okay. Uh, so the third part of the same question is, does this act apply when the personal data is collected and processed in India is about foreign nationals? That's a good question. If you're processing data about foreign national who is not residing in India at all, then this act is not applicable. So for purely international BPOs, as an example, I'm saying, if they are already having a contract with their client outside India and they are processing personal data of citizens who are totally outside India, this act is not applicable. And it's mentioned in the special provisions also of this act, it's mentioned there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last part of this question is, uh, is there any penalty for data principle uh, and for what? Data principle, as I mentioned in one of the slides, up to 10,000 rupees, if they are suppressing some material information which they are obligated to provide, or if they are impersonating some other person, or if they are making a false complaint, and so on and so forth. That means a breach of integrity is then uh, can be penalized up to the beast 10,000 for the data principle. Okay. Thank you so much for the answers, Deeraj. So, um, uh, we have still a lot of questions uh, left with us, but don't worry, we will answer that questions in our uh, mails and the PPT that we will be share you, sharing you soon. And I would like to thank all the participants and the speakers for joining us here today. And uh, all the participants will receive a link of this recording of the webinar uh, and are available assets uh, as the resources. However, to get this, con uh, this great content, please, uh, we request you to please com uh, complete the post event survey form. And that will pop after you uh, finish up this uh, webinar. Uh, if you have any questions regarding this, um, webinar any more questions please uh, indicate in the survey form and we will get back to you uh, right away once again thank you so much for attending today's session we shall see you soon have a great day thank you thank you everyone thank you, thank you all for the session thank you bye bye